And uh, this is a program on bases, and uh, Joan Doty has been collecting bases and studying the bases uh, for some time now. So uh, I know that uh, we are uh, calling on the expert in bases. As I said earlier, bases uh, are one of those collectibles that has not uh, gained a lot of popularity in the past, but in the past few years, uh, we've noticed that there has been an increased interest and in, as shown by the increased price of the bases themselves. So uh, the, the programs uh, are for education, and I'm sure there's going to be a, a lot of education here. And the Dodies, uh, we are indebted to Dave, uh, those of us that need a photograph periodically of a piece of glass that we can't find. Uh, Dave spends a lot of time at the auctions and conventions of photographing glass, and he does a very good job with, uh, with the photograph of a carnival. Like most of us know they're trying to take a little brownie and set a piece up on the table and get a picture that is presentable is rather difficult, even to those uh, collectors that have been doing it for some time. John Lucille had kind of got a master too, but uh, Dave has uh, photographed a lot of pieces of carnival, and uh, I know that uh, the different clubs have used uh, his services and called him and asked him for a photograph, and he usually has that photograph available and sent it to us. So we appreciate we that very much, Dave, for that effort, and uh, it's a very good <coughs> source of information for us also. So, uh, we hope that you uh, enjoy the program. Uh, as an announcement before we start, uh, the hospitality room will be open on the party deck after this program or shortly thereafter as soon as the ladies can get things organized and get out there. So uh, we want you to just enjoy your evening and enjoy the program and uh, socialize and uh, do whatever you would like to do and enjoy the activities. So. Uh, we would like to uh, thank again Joan for coming to bring her glass and uh, being with us and putting on the program. So we'll uh, turn it over to Joan and let her uh, present her program. Thank you again, Joan. <coughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. Bob first asked me to do this. I said, you want me <laughs> <laughs> to talk in front of people, most of whom know a lot more about Carnival than I do. Bob was very reassuring. He said, don't worry, it'll be fine. We're going to videotape the whole thing. <laughs> But he also said, people will help you, and they have. They've been wonderful. Charlie and Eleanor Mokel have brought two of the most gorgeous tree trunk funerals I think I've ever seen. George Thomas has been a tremendous help with the tree trunks as well, uh, not just with this seminar, but with my entire understanding of tree trunks. Ken Openlander has been a tremendous help with the ripples. Uh, from the very first time that we met him, which was at the very first convention we went to, which happened to be Hoga. We walked into a room, and here was a man measuring vases. And I knew I had come to the right place. <laughs> it was uh, at that convention that we saw in one of the rooms, and we could never get into it, the door kept being closed, we just looked through the window and way over on the chest, see just a silhouette, this gorgeous vase. And we kept going back and looking through the window. Finally, the man was open. The vase was still there. We went in and it was even more beautiful than it was from the window. We, we couldn't believe it. It was... Uh, more than we had been accustomed to paying at that time. But it wasn't as much as we thought it should have been for what it was. 
So we thought, well, there must be something wrong with it. <laughs> and of course, we were new. We didn't know that you could ask. And people would tell you. We've been accustomed to dealing with flea market dealers where you say, is there anything wrong with this? They said, no, no, perfect. They said, well, what about these chips? I said, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> but carnival people are different. They'll tell you. But we didn't know this. We went over every millimeter of that vase. Could not find one speck of damage. So we bought it. Took it back to the room, set it up, admired it. And Dave kept saying, you know, there has to be something wrong with this. <laughs> you should have wanted more for it. Finally, he said, I don't know what's wrong with it. Look at it. It doesn't have any iridescence on it. It's not carnival. <laughs> and of course, he was right. It was a very beautiful amethyst opalescent foggy bayou. But it wasn't carnival. Oh, <laughs> well, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, to say it's carnival vases that we collect, not opalescent vases. Well, we'll see if we take, he'll take it back. So we wrapped it up and we went back upstairs and spent the rest of the afternoon walking up and down in front of his room trying to get the courage to go in. <laughs> Finally, he was going to leave, so we went in and he was very nice. And he said, well, of course he would take it back. He said, you mean you didn't know this wasn't carnival? <laughs> <laughs> but he knew we had checked it out very carefully. And he said, did you find any damage? I said, oh, no, not a speck of damage. Not a speck of iridescence either. <laughs> <laughs> but what had attracted us to that vase? was the absolutely gorgeous shape. And that's what we find so intriguing about swung vases. A vase that has been swung is literally glass <coughs> that is in motion. There is a tool that glassmakers use. It's called a snap. And when a piece is lifted out of the mold, they use one of those wooden Y-shaped tools. And it's set down, you have to come closer. <laughs> and it's set down on this spring-loaded snap, okay, which clamps very securely around the collar base. <laughs> it's then taken back to the furnace and reheated in the glory hole. Now, each vase is reheated slightly differently. Slightly different spots, slightly different temperatures. Then it's taken out and literally swung by the glassmaker. sometimes tell how a particular vase has been swung. For instance, these mid-sized tree trunks were probably given a, an easy pendulum type of swing. Or about ones that were stretched out further, possibly went all the way around. And when a vase goes all the way around very quickly, the leading edge cools more quickly. Therefore, the back stretches out further and then you have a lovely angled top. And all of these vases are the result of glass that is literally in motion. And there's probably no other pattern that so effectively uses this as Imperial's ripple. This was a vase that was designed to be swung. The pattern is very simple. 17 horizontal rings, a counterpoint of shallow, fine ribs, and six scallops. And as you can see, they're all alike. Imperial made ripples for many years, and they even reissued them in the 60s and 70s. Now, all of the reissues that I have seen
have been on clear base glass, either marigold or uh, a bluish gray that Imperial called peacock. Now Ken says that there are also pink ones, but I haven't seen them. <clears throat> All that I have seen have the IG in the center of the star on the base. Now then, I'll just pass these around and they will pass those around and, and you all can have a good look at them because these vases were also swung so each one is slightly different. Because Imperial <coughs> did... Oh, I wanted to tell you one other thing. I've only seen them in two base sizes that is just under three inches and just under four inches. The original ripples were made in five different base sizes. And here we have along the top shelf three of the colors in each of the five different base sizes. Because Imperial produced them for so long, they can be found in probably just about every color that Imperial made. We have uh, down here on the bottom shelf uh, purple, lavender, aqua, smoke, teal, helios, green, amber, whatever else I didn't name. <laughs> and then there are a few what have to be accidental colors, such as yellow, this is a very, very pale blue. I'm not sure about the olive, whether that's accidental or intentional. Ken Openlander became intrigued with the tremendous ranges of heights and colors in all the different base sizes and is compiling what is becoming a fascinating survey, which is what he was doing when we met him the first time. Uh, you all may have seen the latest results, which he published in a recent bulletin month or so ago. Now this is an ongoing survey that he has, so if any of you all have any ripples that Ken doesn't know about, he needs the diameter of the vase, the height of the vase, and the color. And if you should happen to remember from whom and when you got it, it would be helpful <coughs> to avoid duplication. But what is even more important is that he needs all ripples not just unusual ones, but it's all ripples that give validity to the survey. Another pattern that became even more interesting when it was swung is Dugan's lined lattice. I've always thought this was a very pleasing little vase. It's where the pattern is the vase. The bottom ring of lattices make the little feet and the top ring make the flames. It was originally produced by Northwood, pre-carnival, in opalescent glass, and then it was called Palisades. They were among the molds transferred to Dugan, and Dugan made all the carnival examples. I found it very curious that none of the opalescent ones that Northwood made were swung. But it's very easy to understand because the vase has no collar base on which to clamp the snap for swinging. Somehow, Dugan found a way to swing them because they're found anywhere from less than five inches to about 16 inches high. Another curious thing about this pattern is that there were three separate molds. One of the molds has the mold seam right down the center of the little feet. And those sit very flat and the feet stick straight out. There's another mold where the mold seam is between the feet. And these are generally right up on the points of the lattices. Then there is a third mold that has rectangular feet. And they're sometimes called square toes. The two tallest ones in amethyst and marigold have the square toes. They're always much larger, heavier vases and uh, can be found generally from about 11 to 16 inches. 
there. Uh, no, not that one. Oh. I just wanted to show comparison. I've only seen them in the square toed ones in various shades of amethyst and an occasional marigold. They tend to be much scarcer than the ones with the triangular feet. Now, the tri triangular feet uh, can be found anywhere from less than five inches oh, to about 11 inches. And they can be found in all the usual Dugan colors, marigold, <coughs> many shades of amethyst, white, peach opal, I keep hearing about a blue one, but I haven't seen that yet, but, but it is possible. <coughs> Another pattern that was produced in opalescent glass pre-carnival is Northwood's tree trunk. But it was only when they been, began producing the carnival examples that they gave us a veritable forest of sizes and variations. George Thomas sorted these all out in a, a wonderful article that he wrote. It's originally in the Texas newsletter in 1991. He has since updated it when, when he sorted all of these out because they can be very confusing. When you talk about swung vases, you talk about size. The size refers to the diameter to the base. Height has nothing to do with the size. Tree trunks come in three sizes. Each and every tree trunk is one of these sizes, but only one. You have the standard size, mid size, and funeral size. You cannot have a standard size mid-size, for instance. The standard size has a base diameter of three and an, three eighths to three and a half inches. It can be found has a three-part mold. It can be found in probably most all the colors that Northwood made. From a, the heights are oh, about five and a half to eleven and a half inches. Now there is a variation which has a star on the base, and this is a three and three quarter inch base. And I believe that that is probably Northwood's original tree trunk mold. It's most often found in a light marigold or a green with a marigold iridescence sometimes just on the top that is very, very typical of early Northwood Carnival. <coughs> Tree trunk mid-sizes have a base diameter, these two in the back, have a base diameter of four and three-quarter inches with a four-part mold. Uh, they can be found in Amethyst or purple is the most frequent color. Uh, green, marigold. Blue is scarce. Ice green, ice blue, white are all scarce. There are maybe five or six. We're trying to figure it out. Aqua opal is a marigold over custard. There's even one sorbini, which is a blue slag type of glass. Now then, there is a mid-size variant which has a smooth band between the collar base and the beginning of the pattern. Now that mid-size variant is probably the scarcest of all of the tree trunk variations. It has a base diameter of three and three quarter inches, which is of course the same, it's one of the standards but it has a four-part mold. It can be found in amethyst, and there are a few in marigold and a few in green. All tree trunk funerals have that same smooth band between the collar base and the beginning of the pattern. All tree trunk funerals have a base diameter of five and a quarter inches. If it's not five and a quarter inches, 
It's not a tree trunk funeral. There are some tree trunk funerals that were not swung and are called jardinaires. They range from eight to maybe 10 inches high. They're quite often flared and ruffled, very magnificent. There are only, oh, maybe five or six of them known and they're all amethyst. Now then, if a tree trunk funeral was swung, but only to a height of 15 inches or less, then <coughs> it is an elephant foot. According to George uh, John Muehlbeier coined this term sometime in the 70s where he had two of those short, massive tree trunk funerals. He said, they look just like elephant feet. Very cylindrical, massive, gorgeous vases. Now then, the taller vases can be generally found from 16, 17 to more than 20 inches high. Uh, fiery amethyst is the most frequently found color. Then blue. Uh, the green, the white, ice blue, ice green, and marigold, surprisingly. You can probably count on the fingers of one hand the number known in each of those colors. Now then, measuring the diameter to the base, counting the mole seams, is not always uh, convenient or even possible. But I discovered a very interesting thing about this. Every mid-sized tree trunk, excuse me, every standard-sized tree trunk I've ever seen has nine flames. Every mid-sized tree trunk has ten flames. Every funeral tree trunk has twelve flames. So that if you're talking to someone on the phone about a tree trunk and you have some doubts, Ask them how many flames it has. Are there any questions about tree trunks? I know it's very confusing. Uh, swung vases were made in more than 60 different patterns. Most of them, or rather the majority of them, in the vase shape only. Now there are three of those patterns that can be confusing because they all have the term bullseye in the name of the pattern. This is Imperial's beaded bullseye. It is probably the most frequently one seen. It comes in one size. The heights range from, oh, about six and a half to 13 inches. Uh, it's most often seen in marigold. Purple is scarce. Various shades of green, amber, Vaseline are all very scarce. The tops can be very cylindrical, flared out, flared out to what is called a wide mouth. And we even saw a pair once where it was flared all the way out to the horizontal. We didn't buy them because we thought they were ugly. <laughs> This, this vase, of which there are two examples, is a vase with an identity problem. It is bullseye and beads, which sounds like a dyslectic beaded bullseye. <laughs> People look at the vase. It's obviously a Fenton vase. It has hobs on it. Must be a rustic. It's not. It's Fenton's bullseye and beads and found not only in blue and marigold, but a scarce amethyst, and is not seen very often at all, which may be just as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is Millersburg Bullseye and Loop. Uh, Hostetler's had one this afternoon that was shorter. Can m be most often found in the amethyst, like they have about seven inches high. It can range as high as 12 inches. Uh, green is scarce, and I've seen one marigold. And this was at a convention a year or so ago, and John Britt said that it was the only 
Marigold, Bolta, and Luke that he had seen in 25 years. So one of the interesting things about that is that it's one of the few Millersburg patterns with a smooth base. This vase, Millersburg's tulip scroll, the diamond <coughs> pictures and tumblers are among the very few Millersburg pieces with a smooth base. So watch out for a plain old marigold vase with a smooth base. <laughs> there is uh, an interesting thing about this <coughs> beaded bullseye. I don't know if you all can see it from where you are. You can certainly come up and look afterwards. It has what is called triple doped iridescence, which means that the iridescence looks as though it has been selectively applied. Each of the bullseyes around the top and the bottom are electric blue with brilliant purple centers. The connecting hobs are the same. Even the little beads around the bull's eyes are electric blue with little bright purple centers. The rest of the iridescence is green. Now, how did this happen? David Cotton told me an interesting theory. And that is that the color of the iridescence is determined by the temperature of the glass at the time the iridescence is sprayed on. The thinner the glass, the more quickly it cools. Now, this holds true for a lot of imperial pieces, particularly the purple ones, but also some of the purple Dugan ones. Now, why it's true for some pieces and not others, I can't answer. <coughs> But does anyone have any questions that maybe I can answer? <laughs> I think the term plunger base refers to this band, the smooth band. I think it's just another term for a smooth band. Right, because I have heard rustics referred to that way, and there are some rustics that have a smooth band also. Any other questions? The very tall ba uh, swung bases, were they standing on some tall platform? <laughs> very, very tall people swing. Well, to tell you the truth, uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good question. <laughs> those of you who are interested, we have a handout. I think we may have overestimated or underestimated rather the number of people who might be interested in vases so that if you all could take uh, one per couple, it should be enough for everybody. Um, is, that, is that a little short? I missed the name of the pattern. Is, is that an old one? This one, that's a lined lattice in peach opal. Lined lattice. Lined, L-I-N-E-D. Lined lattice in peach opal. Uh, the other <coughs> lined lattices are behind it in the other colors that Dugan made. Any other questions? With all the photographs that we've taken over the years, do you foresee an Book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't, actually true colors like you do. <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever get it all figured out. <laughs> be about this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a disadvantage because I can't remember now that I'm here, but we have like a 20 to 21 inch base. But it seems like the bottom has like lines. What's the rest of the pattern? It's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's rustic or pretty, I don't know. Without looking at it, um, <coughs> it's a bit here in your mind, just, but mm -hmm. it has the collar and then it has... 
It has lines in the collar. I don't think I've seen that. I'd like to see it. <laughs> you have to bring it the next time. Okay. Was the short squatty one on the second row in about five? Was that also a base for a uh, fruit bowl? Oh, the line lattice. Uh, I have not, no, I have not seen that used as a fruit bowl base. Now, there is <coughs> another base that Dugan makes called a big basket weave, which is. From here, it looked like that pattern. Right, and the big basket weave, yes, was the vase pattern <coughs> was used as a base for the fruit bowl. Okay. Now, I have seen some line <coughs> lattices perched on lamps. But U.S. Glass made the lamps and Dugan made the vase. So I have doubts about its originality. Where did, where did Rustic come in? Rustic is a Fenton vase. And it also comes in uh, a number of different sizes and variations, and one of the reasons that I did not talk about it today was that it's too easy to get them muddled. Joan, in the uh, tree trunk, you said up to 15 inches, they thought of the elephant foot, and after that, the funeral rate still has the same. Oh, no, wait. An elephant foot is a funeral vase. Right? Yeah. But you said up to 15 inches, and after that, they thought of something different, but they still have the same. Basin, same oh yeah, it's from the same mold. Why is there a difference in the name? Because the taller ones don't have their own name. It's just a <coughs> taller funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'll have to ask George or possibly John Mulebuyer if he wants to name the tall ones too. <laughs> but that's a good question. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where people get mixed up. An elephant foot has to be 15 inches or shorter. And an elephant foot can only be a tree trunk. <coughs> As long as the total height of the vase is 15 or less. Right, right. The band is found on all tree trunk funerals. All tree trunk funerals have this band. Now, with the mid-size, only the mid-size variant has the band. Is everybody confused? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it, is there a reason why the band with the mid-size and the bigger size makes is it something to do with the There may well be, but uh, I don't, I can't tell you what it is. That's possible. Huh? Has anyone ever taken an elephant's face to an elephant to see whether he's with <laughs> <laughs> true name? We want you to do that. <laughs> I think that would be a nice thing to do. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, Bob may want to say a few words and we can have some pie and I thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>